Thanks for having me. So what does serotonin do? I'm going to take you through some background and introduction to the complexities of serotonin. I'm going to show you some recent empirical work of mine, and then we'll talk a bit about how to make sense of it all. So just so everyone is on the same page, this is the basic anatomy of a neuron. On the left is the cell body, and a message is sent from left to the right side of the screen through what's called an axon, insulated by something called myelin, ultimately ending up at the axon terminals on the right. This is zoomed in to an axon terminal. The sending neuron is on top. The axon terminal is spitting out these red dots, which are neurotransmitters, which then bind to the blue things on the bottom in a receiving neuron called receptors. And the space between is called a synapse, as you may be familiar with. And the red dots there, the neurotransmitter, can take the form of serotonin, which is what we'll cover today, but also dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, glutamate, GABA, and so on. So serotonin was first extracted from the gastrointestinal tract of rabbits, specifically enterochromaffin cells in the gastrointestinal tract. And it was observed to induced, induce contractions. As a result, it was named enteramine. This is in 1937. We now know that most of the serotonin in the body is synthesized in the enterochromaffin cells of the gut. It was later renamed serotonin after it was found in blood to have vasoconstrictive or serotonin properties. That was in 1948. And we now know that serotonin is important for platelet function in the blood. The chemical name of serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptamine and it's often abbreviated 5-HT. Just to be aware of, I'll use serotonin and 5-HT interchangeably in this talk. So introduction to the complexities of serotonin. Serotonin is said to be involved in everything, but responsible for nothing. It's involved in mood, emotion, learning, cognition or thinking, neural development, vomiting, appetite, sex, sleep, pain, migraine, sensation, perception, gastrointestinal function, endocrine function, motor function, vascular function, to name a few. Serotonin is thought to have a role in diverse psychiatric conditions, including depression, anxiety, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. And it's also relevant for understanding drug addiction, also known as substance use disorders. Serotonin is involved in an array of mental phenomena that, phenomena that are relevant for various neuropsychiatric disorders, including impulsivity, one example of which is acting without foresight, compulsivity, which is behavior that persists inappropriately despite adverse consequences, aggression, and also social cognition or thinking about social stuff, social interactions, decisions. Meanwhile, many of the most commonly used drugs to treat mental illness act through serotonin. If you were to ask someone on the street about serotonin, they might come up with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. Common brand names are Zoloft and Prozac. And these are commonly known as antidepressants, which actually is a misnomer because SSRIs are used to treat an array of things, including depression, but also anxiety and OCD, to name a few. And there's a major clinical paradox, which is that when SSRIs are given long term on the order of weeks and months, uh, SSRIs are believed to increase serotonin transmission. 
and consequently can alleviate uh, or elevate mood, restrain panic or inhibit panic, and ameliorate anxiety. Meanwhile, benzodiazepines, which you might know as things like Xanax, alleviate anxiety, but they actually reduce serotonin transmission. So one source of complexity is that there are at least 14 different serotonin receptor subtypes. Remember back to the image with the blue where the neurotransmitter latches on to a receptor like a lock and key. In contrast, to, to put it in perspective, there are only five known dopamine receptor subtypes. Serotonin receptors can have opposing actions. Some can be inhibitory in terms of their effects on the neurons that they um, are communicating with. And some can be excitatory in terms of exciting the, the next neuron in, in the chain of messaging. And serotonin receptors can be found as autoreceptors in the form of an autoreceptor on the cell body, the blue on, um, on the bottom left, or um, on the axon terminal on the top right. And these are sort of sensing serotonin that's been released from that neuron. Uh, and it probably has a homeostatic role. Serotonin can interact with other neurotransmitters. For example, when some serotonin receptors are activated, this can enhance dopamine release. Others, when activated, actually suppress dopamine. And a lot of serotonin releasing neurons actually release other neurotransmitters in parallel at the same time. For example, about 80% of serotonin neurons projecting to the brain co-release glutamate, another neurotransmitter. So this diversity of serotonin receptors and function likely grew out of the fact that serotonin is actually one of the oldest molecular mechanisms for communicating between cells, serotonin action at its receptors. And this dates back to the emergence of simple nervous systems in evolutionary history. So there are neuroanatomical subsystems of serotonin. Serotonin releasing neurons in the central nervous system or CNS, which refers to the brain and spinal cord, originate from the RAFE nuclei, which translates to seam. Nuclei are clusters of neuron cell bodies, and these are located near the midline throughout the brainstem that's shown on the bottom right, the more yellowish part is the brainstem. And I'm just pointing out there where the front of the brain is. So this is a sort of a sideways view of, of the brain. If you were looking, it's a profile view of the brain. And we know that no single region of the central nervous system is devoid of serotonergic innervation. Of particular importance for my talk are the dorsal and median RAFE nuclei. And the reason this is important is because they differ in a number of properties, especially their anatomical projections. So the cell body originates in the brainstem, and then one of those little blobs in the yellowish area in the brainstem in the, in the image, and then projects, uh, the axon projects elsewhere in the brain, indicated by these blue lines with the arrows. So we know that the MRN, as it's abbreviated, for instance, projects to or sends uh, messages to the hippocampus, amygdala, and some parts of the cerebral cortex, whereas the DRN, or dorsal RAFE, that innervates all major forebrain structures, sort of the, the upper, upper part of the brain above the brain stem, 
uh, as well as the amygdala. But even there, there are subsystems within the DRN. So serotonin function as it pertains to today's topics. Um, so we know that serotonin is widely implicated in flexible decision-making. We know that it's classically implicated in processing negative events or aversive events, aversion. And it's also increasingly recognized to be involved in reward processing as well. So serotonin is very complex, yet there is limited means for exploring this intricacy directly in humans. So one thing you can do is deplete serotonin. The most common way of doing this in humans is a dietary technique to lower serotonin function called acute tryptophan depletion or ATD. ATD is a acronym to remember because I will be referring to it uh, much more in this talk. And in non-human animals, you can neurotoxically uh, destroy serotonin neurons. Um, and you can also get regional specificity in doing this. You can say target a, a particular brain region. But in humans, you really have to rely on um, a globe, so-called global manipulation where you're affecting all brain regions and it's a little less clear exactly where um, you are affecting. You can also promote serotonin signaling. And this can be done by repeated SSRI administration. Uh, yet it's important to note that a single dose of SSRI can actually paradoxically decrease serotonin. And this is probably related to the phenomenon when someone starts an antidepressant treatment in the form of an SSRI, it's common uh, for people to get worse before they get better. Um, and this is probably tied to the autoreceptors I mentioned before that serve a homeostatic role. Um, and these autoreceptor feedback effects need to be overcome with repeated dosing before you start to see an effect of an antidepressant, of a serotonergic antidepressant like an SSRI. And then there are psychedelic drugs like psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms or LSD. Um, MDMA, which is ecstasy, um, also falls into this category of activating the serotonin 2A receptor. That's their, uh, that leads to the characteristic psychedelic effects of things like LSD. But these drugs also affect other serotonin receptors as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a few more details about acute tryptophan depletion or ATD because that's the primary um, technique uh, used in the data I'll show you today. So as I mentioned, it's one of the most commonly used techniques to study serotonin in humans. And this it capitalizes on the amino acid tryptophan being essential for humans, meaning that we cannot actually synthesize it ourselves. We have to consume it from the diet. And it happens to be the precursor molecule required for serotonin synthesis. And that's highlighted in the top of the figure on the right, a little uh, demonstration of part of the synthesis pathway of serotonin. So the way this sort of study works is participants arrive in the morning of the study without having eaten breakfast. It's conducted in a double blind, randomized, placebo controlled way, just like you would a, a clinical trial or a, a drug study. And you give participants an amino acid powder mixed with water and some flavoring. The placebo drink contains tryptophan, whereas the depletion drink does not. And we think this works for three main reasons. One is the more obvious, depleting tryptophan. But by also giving a load of amino acids in the drink, those amino acids actually compete for tryptophan to cross the blood-brain barrier to get into the brain. And 
by loading with these amino acids, it also stimulates protein synthesis in the liver, which ends up consuming more of the remaining tryptophan in your body. So what about the, some of the clinical effects of acute tryptophan depletion? So there's an interesting gradation of mood effects of tryptophan depletion. If you are someone who is in remission from depression, but taking serotonergic medications, ATD tended to induce a relapse of symptoms. These go away after you start eating normally again. And this is not my data, this is, uh, these, these are older studies. So if you are drug-free and in remission from depression, that could result in a moderate lowering of mood. If you're healthy, but have a family history of depression, you could see a slight lowering of mood. But healthy individuals without a family history of depression or history of depression themselves are consistently unaffected in, in their mood as assessed by um, self-report. So the initial goal of the human ATD studies was to ask the question, is the relationship between low serotonin and low mood causal? And as I hope is clear from this slide, the reality is that it really depends on the person. So in the first experiment I'm gonna show you, the motivating question was by administering tasks computer tasks that elicit emotion, can we then observe patterns that are relevant for vulnerability? So the first thing we'll look at is guilt. Guilt is one of a number of items uh, in the diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder. Proneness to guilt, consistently correlates with empathy. You'll see why I'm mentioning that momentarily. Guilt also appears to foster reparative action, promote empathy and increase altruistic acts. Empathy and serotonin. So we know that the serotonergic psychedelic drugs that I mentioned before, like LSD, psilocybin, but MDMA is also grouped with them. These drugs pr actually have been shown to promote empathy. Moral decision-making in individuals who are very high in trait empathy is actually more sensitive to changes in serotonin. And elevated empathy has been proposed as a possible risk factor for depression, the idea being that if you're sensitive to distress in others, you may be more likely to experience personal distress. Okay, so conversely, in uh, psychopathic individuals or those with antisocial tendencies, empathy is classically lacking. And using behavioral economic games in a laboratory setting a number of studies have documented increased retaliatory behavior to injustice in incarcerated individuals with psychopathy, individuals who have damage to a part of their frontal lobe called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex or VMPFC, but also healthy individuals after getting the tryptophan depletion procedure. So we know that social behavior is affected by serotonin, but what about social emotion? So that's what we looked at first with acute tryptophan depletion. And the way we did this was presenting a series of cartoon scenarios. This is an example of one on the screen that depicted um, some sort of social injustice occurring. In this case, someone was watching another person's dog and then they lost it. So the scenario is described on the first screen, top left, 
Then on the top right is would be the next screen that the participant sees where a character in the story is circled in red. And then they're prompted, if this was you, how would you feel? And then in the bottom would be the next screen where they have to rate uh, how they would feel. And uh, for our purposes today, we're going to focus on guilt and annoyance. But we also looked at shame, which I'd be happy to talk about. So we wanted to harness individual differences in personality to see if we could understand, better understand some of the nuances of serotonin function. As I said, this is a study of healthy individuals. And before they got either depletion or placebo, we had them fill out a questionnaire that assesses trait empathy, another questionnaire that assesses trait psychopathy. And then they got depletion or placebo, and then they did the computer task and did uh, filled out ra ratings on the computer of guilt and annoyance to social injustice. And what we found is shown here. So on the y-axis is guilt. So higher y-axis values are, more, are, are higher guilt ratings. And on the x-axis is empathy scores. So that's increasing going to the right. The blue is placebo, whereas the green is depletion. And what this is showing you is that with increasing trait empathy scores, following depletion, people showed more guilt. So more guilt in the highly empathic after acute tryptophan depletion. This graph is set up in a similar way, but instead we're looking at annoyance and psychopathy. So on the y-axis is uh, ratings of annoyance, and on the x-axis is trait psychopathy. The blue, again, is placebo, which you can see there's a pretty, pretty flat line. Whereas in the depletion group, as psychopathy scores increased, annoyance ratings increased. And this was in the depletion condition. So higher annoyance ratings in those higher in trait psychopathy in particular, following depletion. So the empathy results that I showed you nicely parallels a new study in clinical depression from some of our Danish colleagues here. They use the same exact computer task in individuals, unmedicated individuals with major depression and found that guilt was indeed elevated, which is what we saw in the highly empathic following tryptophan depletion. So now we're gonna go from self-report to objective measures of emotion. Emotional learning about threatening and safe situations is impaired in several psychiatric disorders, including OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, and schizophrenia. And this can be modeled in a laboratory setting using Pavlovian threat conditioning. That's what's depicted here. So let's say the the purple colored face is face A, and that is paired with a mild electric shock to the forearm that is calibrated by the participant at a level that they agree on that's supposed to be uncomfortable, but not painful. And the green face is never paired with a shock. So that would be face B, let's call it. And the participant quickly and automatically, implicitly learns to anticipate receiving a shock when seeing the bottom image. Um, and this can be measured with sensors on the fingertips as shown here that pick up on perspiration or mild sweating. 
So this is an objective measure of, of an emotional response to anticipating threat. And the, the black uh, box with the cross in it, um, that's just what is shown between the images um, for a few seconds. So what I'm showing you here is what happened after participants underwent this procedure while they were either under a placebo condition or a acute tryptophan depletion condition. The depletion is shown in the light blue. Placebo is in the dark blue. On the y-axis is the magnitude of the skin conductance response, or basically how much they were sweating. And as you can see, the depletion group showed enhanced uh, skin conductance. They were sweating more to uh, the faces in anticipation of getting shocked. But what if the cues aren't innate threats like the faces, as I think the faces should be called? I, I believe they represent innate threats. So what I'm going to show you next would be when faces are not in the picture, uh, but instead it's something neutral like just a green colored square on the computer screen or a purplish colored square on the computer screen. Otherwise, the procedure is the same. So it turns out that Pavlovian threat conditioning, as this is called, to neutral cues, but not faces, was actually attenuated, lowered by ATD. So there's an opposite effect for, for learned, in other words, the neutral colored squares versus innate threats when undergoing Pavlovian conditioning of this kind. So what about learned threat memory? So the goal of the study I'm gonna show you now is essentially to investigate the question, if something bad happened to you yesterday and today you're reminded of that experience, how strong will you react physiologically or emotionally to a reminder? Again, using the skin conductance or the, the mild sweating as our as our outcome measure. So the question is, what's the role of serotonin in how strongly an emotional memory is retained? So we did on day one, Pavlovian conditioning without serotonin depletion, without placebo, just, just no sort of manipulation, just the conditioning. And then participants came back a second day where they did in the morning get either depletion or placebo. And then we subsequently exposed them again to the colored squares to test for a retention of the conditioning, retention of the memory that they had formed the day earlier, but to see if this was modulated by depletion. And as I've indicated, this was with neutral, not innately threatening stimuli, which were the colored squares rather than the faces. And this is what we found. So again, on the y-axis is the magnitude of skin conductance response. So more sweating is a higher bar. And then the x-axis is um, showing you different stimulus types um, and the different conditions. So the light blue, is depletion. You can see all of those bars are lower and the placebo is in the dark blue. You can see all those by bars are higher. So the CS minus on the left, um, so that's the safe image that was never paired with a shock. Um, whereas the CS plus, there were two different CS pluses. I won't go into that right now. Um, but the message is that actually in this case, Emotional responding was attenuated to all stimulus types, um, even the, the one that was never paired with a shock, which 
I think does still reflect an anticipatory anxiety that has been attenuated because there's still some uncertainty about whether you could get a shock with the one that wasn't actually shocked the day before. Okay, so what about when the source of threat changes? So on the left is um, what I showed you previously, acquisition or Pavlovian conditioning, just sort of the acquisition of conditioning. On the right is what's called a reversal phase, which is simply that phase A had been paired with a shock, now it's no longer paired with a shock, it's now safe, whereas phase B, the green one, hadn't been paired with a shock, but now it is paired with a shock, shown on the top right. Okay, so this is called Pavlovian threat reversal learning. The contingency is reverse or swap. So what this graph is showing you is on the left is what I already showed you with initial conditioning to the faces a few slides back. So we're gonna focus on the right side, which is the reversal phase. So again, the y-axis is the magnitude of the sweating. And what this is showing you in the dark blue is uh, the placebo condition and participants were able to acquire emotion to the newly threatening stimulus when contrasted with the old stimulus. Um, and in the light blue, um, the very tiny bar is the depletion condition. And this is showing you that there was a reversal deficit. So there is a, a deficit in updating emotion to be reflective of the changed, the new environmental circumstances. So that was flexibility of emotion using Pavlovian reversal learning. What about flexibility of behavior? Now we're gonna talk about instrumental reversal learning. So the basic idea here is that you use a task where choosing option A, but not option B, leads to a reward. Later, just like we just discussed in the Pavlovian situation, here, the rule changes, the rule reverses, and now B is optimal, and you should no longer be choosing option A. So we know from marmoset monkeys that if you deplete serotonin neurotoxically from the uh, orbital frontal cortex, or OFC, marmosets perseverate, which means that they keep choosing the old option. They don't. They are impaired at updating their responses. So, what about acute tryptophan depletion in humans? So that is shown to you here. On the y-axis is trials to criterion, which is basically just higher values are worse performance. And on the x-axis are different phases of the experiment. So acquisition is just when they were learning that A is better than B. Reversal one is when they need to learn that, okay, now B is better than A. I need to start choosing that. Reversal two, it swaps back again. And reversal three, it swaps back yet again. And the depletion condition is shown in the light blue. Placebo is in the dark blue. And as you can see from the higher values in the depletion group, uh, performance was impaired. So it took people longer to adapt their responses when the first and second reversals occurred but they were okay at learning the initial, um, the, the initial contingency in the acquisition block on the left. And the reason this is important is because instrumental reversal learning is impaired in compulsive disorders. So understanding how serotonin affects flexible decision-making 
is relevant to OCD as well as drug addiction. So what I have shown you is that acute tryptophan depletion, the most common method for lowering serotonin function in humans, enhances guilt if you are if you were high in trait empathy. Meanwhile, if you were higher in trait psychopathy, following ATD, annoyance was enhanced. So this is an example of how accounting for personality traits allowed for a deeper understanding of serotonin's effects and hopefully informed vulnerability as well. Next, ATD enhanced conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning, when the cues were innate threats. But when the cues were previously uh, neutral, like um, colored squares or learned threats, ATD actually diminished the expression of conditioning that had been acquired a day earlier. So serotonin has opposite effects on innate and learned threats. Meanwhile, ATD impaired both Pavlovian and instrumental reversal learning, which shows that serotonin plays an important role in the flexible updating of emotion or behavior as circumstances change. So how do we make sense of the emotional ups and downs? So we said that ATD enhances guilt in the highly empathic. This is possibly related to serotonin projections going from the MRN, which I mentioned earlier, median raphe nucleus, to the hippocampus. And this pathway has been implicated in depression and rumination. It's been referred to as a resilience system, and it's actually restored by chronic treatment with SSRIs, or commonly used antidepressants. So serotonin had opposite effects on innate and learned threats. This is probably related to the activation of different serotonin projections going from the DRN or dorsal raphe nuclei to the amygdala for anticipatory anxiety and to the PAG or periaqueductal gray, which is a brainstem structure. Uh, and if you stimulate it, um, you will likely have a panic attack. So serotonin appears to be doing different things in these two pathways and also different subregions or subnuclei of the amygdala and receptor subtypes are engaged by innate versus learned threats. This can all be thought of as uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the context of a proximal versus a distal threat. Uh, a proximal threat versus a distal threat, something to be panicked about right now or something to be anticipated um, and, and monitored before, before fleeing. And this framework has been used to explain why serotonin restrains panic via the periaqueductal gray, yet promotes anxiety via signaling to the amygdala. So what does serotonin do? Clearly quite a lot. The manifestation of what serotonin does likely depends a whole lot on which anatomical projections and receptors are involved. A unifying theme could be plasticity. In other words, adaptability to the environment. And this is manifested in my talk via effects of serotonin on learning, memory, and considering traits as possible biological priors that we enter the world in, that we enter the world with, that influence our interactions and responses to it. Thanks to my PhD supervisor, Professor Trevor Robbins, and thanks for listening.